glad to see each one of you this morning. You could have chosen to be anywhere else today, but you chose to be with us, and I thank you for that. If you ask your Bible, we turn to John chapter 7, where we open the service, and just hold your finger there for a minute, and uh, I'll see if I can get you out in a timely manner. It means something. I don't know if y'all realize it or not, but <clears throat> I could, I, I, I'm not really a news junkie as, as much as I like to pay attention. I like to be in the know about what's going on. They, they, but they have some stuff that comes across the news feed sometimes that frustrates me. Last week I shared one. This morning I, I saw another one. And, it, and at first glance, I had to do a double take. It said something along the line. Mother arrested for stabbing or threatening, sorry, threatening her mother and her son with a knife. I was like, come on, man. Really? So, of course, I'm thinking it may be clickbait, but I go on and click on it because I want to see what this is all about. And it's all over an iPad that was gotten from school. The mother had decided that because the son had lost the iPad, he should be responsible for it. I'm, I'm down with that. I'm good with that. But the mother of the mother, grandma, just didn't think that was fair, and she would just go ahead and pay for the iPad. Mama was having no part of it, and her son, because he was being verbally abusive to her, she pulled a knife on me. Let me just go ahead and tell you now. It would not be a murder investigation. It'd be, everybody would know exactly what happened if I ever would have done something stupid like that. Our world has gone crazy. I mean, it, it is showing its true colors. And then I want to just I want to point out something to you. I, I, I don't, if you're not a news junkie, then you, you really don't know what I'm talking about. But you know, it's been several days since we've had any new stories, any new allegations about Judge Roy Moore. It, it just all, man, I'm talking about they were hitting us day after day after day, and all of a sudden it's gone silent. Just say it. Now, and this is the only politics we're going to talk this morning, I just, and I feel, the, I feel the need. So for the voters that I have listening to me today, not just here, but those that were here in the days to come, I want to encourage you to use your noggin as we approach December 12th. Amen. First of all, do not stay home. You need to vote. Amen. And as always, I'm going to encourage you, vote your conscience. You see, me, I, I could care less about the people. See, when I'm looking at a politician, I'm looking at them like I'm hiring them to do a job, just like I would a man in the field. I don't care what color they are. I don't care if they male or female, if they can do the job, if they have the tools, and they have the willingness to do the job, that's who I hire. I'm not stressing about any, any external whatsoever. Matter of fact, unless I'm working somewhere that requires it, I don't really care what's in their past. If he can pass a drug test, has the basic skills and tools and the want to, I'm hiring him. And that's the way I approach an election like this. I look, I, first of all, I want to know what they believe. I want to know, do they really have the characteristics and the, the, the record to back up what they say? I've told you, there's only a few non-negotiables for me. Where do they stand on life? Do they understand basic economics? Uh, do they have an understanding of the Constitution? And do they have a basic understanding of the government's role? And that's a very simplified version. As long as they meet those criteria, I don't really care. I said, it's going to get my vote. So I just want to point out something to you about the deal going on with Roy Moore. Quick, if you depend on what reports you listen to and what stations you watch, you'll get the, the headline will go, another female has come and accused Judge Roy Moore of some kind of sexual impropriety. You do realize there's only two that have accused him of sexual impropriety. 
Now, the others accused him of hitting on them or trying to speak to them or something, but you know, there's no law against speaking to another human being, no matter what age they are. If it is me, Tina, and Alex, we, we, we're going to jail because we speak to every little baby at Walmart that look at us. We wave at them, they grin at us, they speak, we speak back. We just can't help it. You know what I'm talking about? Baby, babies are meant to be talked to and held. Everybody knows that. But there's only been two women that have accused Judge Roy Moore of something illegal. One says she was 14 when he, we tried to do something, and of course her, she has just disappeared. She has fallen off the map. Can't even get an interview with her. And the other one made these claims that he would sexually assaulted her. That's exactly what she claims. And they, they have done picked her apart now. She has no credibility. So I just want you to think. 40 years, public service. 40 years, he has run many campaigns. Just recently had the entire Republican Party going against him, spent $30 million and couldn't dig this up. So just want keep thinking. You use this noggin, ask this question. What are they? When I say they, what 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 is the New York Times and the Washington Post? and the establishment in Washington, D.C., what are they so afraid of? Think, just think about that. If he is what they say he is, he is nothing but a podunk, backwoods, country bumpkin judge from Alabama, what are they so afraid of? If he is as stupid as they say he is, let him get elected. Let him go make a fool of himself. They are showing their ignorance and their own stupidity. Amen. They are scared to death of something. Think. I'm not telling you to vote for Roy Moore. I'm just telling you to think. I find it quite odd. And I think Roy Moore put his finger on it quite, quite eloquently. Because he speaks as well as I do. Poor old fellow. The entire forces of evil have been released on him. Amen. Not on his campaign. On him. Amen. Why? I mean, seriously, I mean, does that is that a valid question? If he is as stupid as they say he is, why do they care? Everybody get in close. You realize Alabama ain't much in the grand scheme of things in this nation. One of the biggest attention drawers down here, we have a space station, I believe, still up around Huntsville, or space, whatever, it's up around Huntsville. <coughs> We've got two tunnels in Mobile, Alabama that everybody hates. Amen. We've got shootings coming out our ears right now for some reason. Why do they care about Alabama? We've got two senators just like everybody else. We don't have anything in the way of representing. I mean, do y'all understand why I'm asking these questions? If, it's the, if, he is, if he is really that insignificant, why do they care? Would y'all like me to tell you one thing to think about? Have you ever thought maybe the prince of, prince of the air Principalities, powers, and high places <coughs> are scared to death because they know the jig is up. You fix to get one man up there that has principles and values, and he is not going to hop on their team. He is not going to join their club. He is not interested in their money. He has run without them. He is not interested in their politics. He is interested in bringing God back to our nation Amen. and constitutional law back to our nation. The jig is up. So as you go to vote, and I hope you do, I want you to remember you vote for the best candidate. Based it on his record or hers. Service policy. That's as political as I'm going to get today. You see, that kind of ties in what we're talking about today, about know your stance. They're scared to death 
of this man because he knows where he stands. You know why they're not afraid of the church in this world, in this nation? You know why the church does not cause them to quake just a little bit? Because the church seemingly doesn't know where she stands anymore. Amen. We waffle and we become so so like jello on so many issues instead of just standing on the word of truth. I'm doing my best. We'll never finish today and that'll be just fine. John chapter 7. Starting in verse 11. This has been extended reading, but I, I, I promise I'll move. So then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but the, he deceives people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but is, that, but is his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, and he that seeks his own glory, that, or he that, but he that seeketh his glory that sent me, the same is true, and no unrighteousness in him. But Moses give, gave you the law, and yet none of you keep it. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goes about to kill him? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whip whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man from know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, you both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ comes, he will do no more miracles than these which this man hath done. The Pharisees heard that, the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief, chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Father, we thank you today. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, in my prayer today is that you would let your teacher come. Lord, that your spirit come and speak to us. Lord, we want to hear the word of truth above all else. Lord, help us to hear and have sanctified hearts and minds to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, as we enter what most of us think of as the Christmas season or the Advent season, see, I don't know if you realize or not, but the switch has flipped. We get to Thanksgiving service and then we have Thanksgiving dinner at my house because Power 88, which plays in my kitchen pretty much 24-7 year round, just so I have some background noise, goes from normal contemporary Christian music to Christmas music. Attitude changes. You'll notice it in the weeks to come. If you deal with people, their attitude will change. You see, Christmas is an air. It kind of gets in the air, doesn't it? We start thinking about Christmas. Matter of fact, the countdown has become, but begun, I think Alex told me this morning, 29 days till Christmas. Praise God. You know, the worst part about that is that means we're not that many days from the 1st of 2018. I hope you accomplished everything you wanted to this year because this year's gone. See, but Christmas is our time. I, I find it a little bit humbling at times that, that, that our, our churches don't embrace the Christmas season. 
I, 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 I got some, some new friends on Facebook. I have found me a bunch of preachers. And, and seriously, I go through and I, I find friends' suggestions and I find these preachers. And I, and I get to be friends with them on Facebook because they put them. I'm, I'm going to tell you what, preachers will put a lot of stuff on there. But um, it said me. I don't put a lot. But I had one put on there. I don't say Christmas. Oh, yeah, trying to trying to start a fight, son. Hey, he's, a, he, he's one of them. He's one of them. I'm going to call him a primitive Baptist. I don't think that's what he is, but I don't say Christmas because it's got the word mass in it, and that is a Catholic thing. That, that is about the substantiation of Christ, and that means Christ is still on the cross, and we know that's not so. And I'm thinking to myself, you're right. I'm still going to say Christmas. See, I want all of you to begin practicing in the days to come, because when you see me next week, I expect to hear Merry Christmas from you. Up until Christmas Eve, when we have our Christmas Eve service, I expect you to start saying Merry Christmas while you're at church. And the reason is, is this is our time. Amen. Two times a year when we should really, really have a, a power in our community, a power in our society is Christmas and Easter. The Advent season. Now, and, and remember, the reason why when, when you start talking about, oh, Christmas is a pagan holiday. Well, Whatever, man. Let me just go ahead and tell you. If you want to be legalistic and all that, and you don't want to leave a little room for magic, if you don't want to believe in the fairy tale that some people say of Jesus being born, I feel for you. You better get a good grip on the, the scripture that says, God resists the proud. It takes a humble individual to believe everything the Bible says. You realize that, don't you? You realize how crazy it sounds? Seriously, I, I mean, see, I have come to, to realize, Ray Comfort said it best, says, God put the gate of salvation low. Let me, let me show y'all what I'm talking about. You know, you know what most people think the gate of salvation looks like? They think the gate of salvation is 50 foot wide and 125 foot tall and everybody is going through it. No, sir. Jesus likened it to a camel going through the eye of a needle. Now you use whatever pic picturology you want to, you can see a little, a, a little sewing needle trying to get the, the camel through it or you can do what it means, that little bitty gate that came into a city they call the eye of a needle. God has placed the gate of salvation low that only the humble, those that have been brought low, can get through. So if you are one of those that don't believe in Christmas, if you don't want to believe in Christmas, and you don't want to believe about shepherds seeing a star, and you don't want to believe about wise men coming, I feel sorry for you. Because God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Amen. Everybody understand what I'm trying to tell you today? You see, as I look at this small passage of Scripture, it says, first thing it says is, is that this was the time during the Feast of Tabernacles. You realize that Christmas time for us is a type of Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was meant to be a time of remembrance. So they took seven days they fellowshiped. They ate together. And for the shock and awe of the sanctified folks, they got together and they drank wine together and they ate cheese and blah, blah, blah. And they listened to the Word of God. And they recounted and rehearsed the goodness of God and everything that they did that whole week. See, the Feast of Tabernacles is when they would get together and they would build booths. You can think of it as a tent in their front yard. Some of them would actually stay in the front yard. They would get out of their nice homes and go and quote unquote rough it in the front yard so that they could remember the goodness of God. What, what goodness is that? In Deuteronomy it tells us that you know, Moses was recounting in his mind. He says when you get together, you celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and remember how good your God has been to you. Remember how you, your shoes didn't wear out and your clothes didn't even get old. I fed you with manna. I fed you with quail. And I poured out water out of a rock. 
when we get together around the Christmas season and we celebrate Christmas, and it ought to be a celebration, thank you very much. It is not that we're celebrating a tree or decorations, but we celebrate who they represent. The light of the world has come into this world for all of us. That is something to celebrate. Amen. I, I, and, and I do kind of wish, I don't pray it because it might come to pass, but I do wish sometimes that we could make Christmas a whole seven-day celebration. You see, we celebrate our Savior's birth. We commemorate his, his birth because that is where hope begins. Hope is purchased on the cross, but it begins in that manger in Bethlehem. See, see as we approach Christmas, I would love for all of us to remember the goodness of God. You understand the tabernacle was a party that lasted seven days. It was a celebration. So imagine now as Jesus has gone up secretly into the, into the town of, of Jerusalem there. Can you imagine what kind of attitude was in the air? There was a spiritual air going on people. Because you know if you start talking about the goodness of God. And remembering the goodness of God. And then you start applying it personally. You start remembering how he brought you out. You start remembering your own testimony and the testimony of your parents and the testimony of your friends and the testimonies of healing and the testimonies of those that have gone on before you, the testimony of the great people of faith who have impacted you through your life. Your attitude will change. And that's what's going on here. Can you imagine getting a whole bunch of Jews together? Some of them non-religious, some of them extremely religious, some of them just regular old folks getting together and talking about how good their God is. You see, what they were really doing is they were rehearsing the goodness of God. Amen. Now look, <coughs> and I said this, it's going to be what it's going to be today. You see, they would have gathered together. They would have gathered together for reading of the Pentateuch. They would have gotten together to hear the teachers teach the Word of God. And they would have watched plays. And they would have listened to cantatas. And they would have, their entire week would have revolved around remembering and, and participating in all these celebrations that they might remember how God provided, even in the worst of times. Hebrews 13 5 says, for he has said, I will never leave nor forsake. See, just like Christmas season, you understand it softens people. Christmas is that time of year where it, it causes others to, to question. Christmas reveals what's already in other people. And today I want to talk to you about three kinds of people that we see in this, this section here. And we'll move quickly. The first ones are, are the Jews. It says the Jews came looking for Jesus saying, where is he? Now remember, whenever we see that word Jews alone, we can usually figure they are religious people. Right? They are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They are the lawyers and they are the scribes. They are normally not seen in a good light whatsoever. Because every time we see them during Jesus' ministry, it does not go good for them. It is never a good interaction. Because most of them are legalists, and Jesus hates legalism. And the reason he does is because rules without relationship lead to rebellion, and that is not what our Lord has come to do. And of course, he also hates this legalism because these are the ones who claim to know God. They claim to know about him. They, they claim to know him personally, even though they'll tell you you can't know him. See, they claim to know the way, but they could not or they would not allow anyone else to get to God. They set the bar so high from a human standpoint. Nobody, nobody. There are some Pentecostals in this world that nobody's making it in. There are some Baptists in this world, nobody's making it in. 
pick a denomination. There are some of them that are so legalistic in their attitude and in their teaching, nobody's making it into heaven except them. Remember the religious people this time of year. They need love too, and they need truth. See, in Luke eleven fifty two, 52, it says, Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 13, Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. The religious people normally know all about the reason for the seat. The Pharisees knew all about the Feast of Tabernacles. They knew everything you were supposed to do. They knew everything you were supposed to not do. And they were just happy with that. But they didn't want anybody else to know the real reason for the seat. Their attitude was follow us. Follow us. And that's never the attitude that we should have. Verse 12 and 13, we, we hear about a second group of people. And this is the one I think I probably fit into when, when I was younger. It says, And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but the, he deceives people. How be it no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews? The second are the people. You have the Jews or the religious people, and then you have just the regular old folks, common people. You see, during this time, they would come to Jerusalem for this Feast of Tabernacles. Now, understand, the Jews have about seven feasts, and most ordinary people have done their best to make one or two a year. You understand, it takes a good bit of time and money to travel from the northern or the southern region to get to Jerusalem to take part in these feasts. So when you hear about regular folks, these are people who have come at great expense for themselves. And common people like us, every trip was a sacrifice. And they're there to remember God's goodness. That they have come to celebrate. And some of them have come to celebrate and didn't even know what they were celebrating, but they didn't care. There was a celebration. They had an opportunity to come be a part, and they would. This is what I would call the unsure crowd. Y'all met some of them people? You, you see, they, they're, uh, they have a problem. They don't know where they stand on Jesus. That, that you will meet some of them, and you will automatically hear them repeat this. They'll say, he is a good man. We, we know about Jesus. He is a good man. He's a good fellow. He is a good teacher. Then others will say, no, he was a liar. He was a deceiver. He, he was just somebody who come along, got a bunch of people to believe this or that, and went on about his business. But you understand that even the very presence of Jesus Christ, even today, causes people to debate. The very presence of Jesus causes offense to religious people. It creates debate among other people. And Christmas is the perfect time of year while we're contemplating, while we're rehearsing, while we're remembering the birth of Jesus Christ. This is the best time to witness to those people. Christmas is the best springboard in the gospel. What? Ray Comfort put out his new, his new video called Christmas Gone Viral, and he explains it the best. He says, Christmas is the best springboard. Because you can engage anybody, even Muslims, about Christmas in the United States of America, and they all know about Christmas. And you ask the question, do you know what Christmas is about? Do you really know what Christmas is about? See, now, us living down here in the third, third hole in the buckle of the Bible belt, we, we don't meet very many people that don't know what Christmas is really about. Just because they don't observe, just because they don't care, just because they're not saved, you will meet people who, <coughs> who know what Christmas is about. I haven't met any that I've said, hey, man, you know what Christmas is about? And they go, nope. Never have. But you know what you can do, though, is, is when you engage them in conversation about Christmas, do you know what, well, 
You know, I kind of know it's about Jesus and the birth of Jesus, but do you know what that really means? I mean, where do you stand? What's your stance on Jesus? What's your stance on Christmas? Do you know your stance? I'll ask you, do you know your stance on Christmas? Because if you don't, you need to arm yourself with some truth. You see, this is when people are the most open because you say Merry Christmas and they say Merry Christmas back and you go, well, do you know what Christmas is about? Because if you're going to tell me Merry Christmas, you should at least know. And if you don't know, please allow me to help you know. But you know, there are many among the crowds today filling churches around our nation that have no idea what Christmas is about. And then we have a whole bunch of people that fit into the crowd that they will not share their faith. They will not talk about Jesus. They will not engage about Christmas, as it says in verse 13, for fear. Now the scripture says for fear of the Jews, of the religious people, but it could be fear of anything. You know why people don't share their faith? There's three reasons why people don't share their faith. Fear. Fear and fear. Fear of other people, fear of rejection, and fear of looking stupid. I got the third one down. Don't take any effort on my part to look crazy, look, look like I don't know what I'm doing, but understand something. If you don't overcome that fear, how are they going to hear about Jesus? You see, it, you're going to have to get over your fear. Even the people in the church that don't want you sharing Jesus, just ignore them and go on and start sharing the gospel with somebody. But now the third group that were there were skeptical believers. That's what I call them. In verse 14 and 15, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Well, I thought you said Jews meant religious people. There's two sets of Jews you'll find in Jerusalem almost all year round. You find the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and lawyers. And they are referred to as Jews. They are usually connected with religious teaching. They are the teachers of the law. But you also have another group of Jews who are there because that's where they live. They are Jews by heredity. They, they are genetic Jews. Most of them are not religious. They fall into the category of our, what, what do you call those, our Easter and Christmas crowd. They're, they're not necessarily observant Jews, just like we have some who claim to be Christians but can only make it to, to church twice a year. Easter and Christmas. So, I call them skeptical believers because they hear Jesus' teaching and they, they say, where did this man come from? How does, he, how does he know all this stuff? And he's never been taught. Now, you know, there are some not necessarily religious people in our world who are amazed when they read Jesus' words. They read the words in red. They read the Sermon on the Mount. They, they read where Jesus says they will know you by your love one to another and they will latch on to that. But they are the same crowd that will turn away when they hear woe unto you. They're the same crowd that will read the book of Revelation when it gets to the, to the part of where it says in Laodicea that I would that you were hot or cold. Because if you're not going to be hot or cold, if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. They don't want to hear that. But they love the teachings of Jesus. You see, because when they read it, they're challenged and they're encouraged. But they're skeptical. Because everybody knows he's just a carpenter from Galilee. And those carpenters are unlearned. It's kind of reminiscent of Acts 4.13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The most frustrated and discouraged I've probably ever been in my life and probably one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life was when that man wouldn't let me talk and he told me what you need to do. 
is get you a four-year degree, two years of seminary, and call me back. I said, but. He said, but nothing. Get you a four-year degree, two years of seminary, and call me. What did the man say? He don't want me. Encouraging, discouraging, enlightenment, all that. Listen to me. The people around Jesus, the really smart people, the regular people, the religious people, looked at Jesus and they were shocked and amazement at what he knew. And Jesus tells me, he says, look, I'm not telling you my own business. I'm telling you what the Father has taught me. You see, you understand that history has proven that Jesus was and is a good teacher. You read him, you, you read his story, you see his sacrifice, and there is no doubt Jesus is a good man. Listen to what he says, and there is no doubt that Jesus is a prophet sent from God. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher, a great preacher. But you see, where the people get skeptical is when you start telling them the complete truth, and that is he is much more than all of that. Jesus is not only a good teacher, he is the teacher. Amen. Jesus is not only a prophet, he is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. Now Jesus gives them this very profound message. He says, My doctrine is not mine, but His that sent me. He, he, sent, the, he sent shock waves throughout the people there because He said, Who sent you? They were thinking, Who sent you? So you're speaking the oracles of God. You are God. That's what you're telling us. And then He says, If any man will do His will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to help some of you today. <coughs> that there are some who will begin to question. And if you don't ever question your faith, I'm going to tell you today, you need to. Examine yourself. Be sure that you're in the faith. Make your calling and election sure. The Bible tells us, be sure that you know who you believe in. Be sure that what you are teaching is true. Be sure. And now, this, so now if I get you to question, you go, well, how am I going to know? Well, Jesus tells us right here. If you are doing what you know is truth, if you are being obedient to what you know of in God's Word, He will help you understand the rest. Do you know why people don't have any quote-unquote new or fresh revelation? They won't do what they know. Oh, let me say that again. Do you know why people don't get revelation or a fresh revelation of God? Is because they will not do what they already know. Amen. Paul says in, in Romans that he has given us everything we need to know. And if we will respond to that, he promises to give more light. And Jesus says here, my doctrine is true. And if you will be obedient to it, you will know more truth. You will know that what I'm saying is true. You won't see. Here's the thing. And I find myself trying to explain somebody in the head. You ever done that? You get engaged in a conversation and they start telling you these things and they, and they have valid questions. So what you do is you go in for the kill and you start trying to explain them into heaven. Why did he get all the animals on the hawk? Well, my standard answer is I'm not sure, but he's God. I'm sure he knows how. So, but there is some evidence to say that more than likely, <clears throat> you know, you don't have to get full grown animals. Just imagine if God would have sent Noah every, every animal in adolescence. All of them, I mean, you think of the biggest animal you can think of. An elephant, a giraffe. Not much bigger than a sheep, as long as they're immature. That makes sense, doesn't it? But now, so now you start trying to explain away the miracles of God. That's not what Jesus is saying. What, what I have to remind myself is, is I need to, I don't have to get them to understand it all. I need to get them to react. Or be obedient to the truth they do know. It's Christmas time. We have, turned, we have moved into the Christmas season. 
Can you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, that he was that God led shepherds there to announce his birth to. Why would he dare do that? Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He brought humble, lowly shepherds to let them know there is one born who is going to bring salvation to the world. What Jesus does, though, is he practices apologetics with them. He tells them, if you just believe it, God will reveal more to you. Then he says, he that speaks of himself, speaks of himself, seeketh his own glory. If Jesus had to come and spend his whole time and his whole ministry talking about his jets and his houses and his cars and his next meeting and his last teaching, nobody would have believed. Matter of fact, I would say Jesus probably would not have been the Son of God if that would have been his attitude. You know what spirit they are. I ain't talking about all the television preachers, but in general, you know what spirit they are of when they start telling you all about their stuff, where they're going, and where they've been. Jesus says, I speak for the one who sent me. That is a word for every preacher I know today. What we need to focus our attention on is not where we've been, not where we're going, but who we know and where our word comes from. You've got to know where you stand. You've got to know your stance on these things. And then he puts a period on all this teaching. He says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous." Judgment. This cuts against the grain. This cut goes straight against Matthew 7. It says, judge not lest you be judged. No, no. See, Jesus says, you don't judge the person. But you're welcome to judge the activity. You see, what they're what they're mad at him about is, is that he would dare heal on the Sabbath day. They are still carrying the grudge and Jesus won't let it go either. He wants them to know that not only does he have the right and responsibility, he has the authority to do so. <clears throat> he tells them, he says, Moses gave you the law, but not one of you keep it. He says, Moses gave you circumcision. But just so you know, Moses didn't give you circumcision. It was of the fathers. God gave Abraham circumcision as a sign. Moses was given circumcision to carry on the legacy of Abraham. And you don't even do that right. Because it don't matter. See, God made provision that you could circumcise on the eighth day, even if it fell on the Sabbath. Because he felt like, he knew that that was more important to keep that as a remembrance of what he told Abraham. And Jesus says, do you not? have some sense. Does it not make sense that I can heal on the Sabbath day? Aren't you glad today that Jesus doesn't say I only heal on the fifth Sunday or the fifth Wednesday or the second Tuesday of every third month? Lord help me Jesus. See, that right there wouldn't work. See, you can't, you can't get me in on the Sabbath day because I don't really know when it is. We've changed the calendar so many times. We've set it front, back, messed it up. We don't know when the Sabbath really is. Every day is a Sabbath day. Every day is a day under the Lord. Everybody say amen. amen. We live in a time when we have the Spirit of God in us and around us and through us and working. And why are we always so busy trying to do something that doesn't belong to us? Do what you know. Judge righteous. Use some walking around see. See, Jesus knows where he stands. He knows his stance from where, when he started. You see, the skeptical believers, you know, they're swayed by negative publicity. You see, but the good thing about negative publicity, and as one of our candidates is noticing, the more negative the publicity, and the more often the negative publicity comes, the more positive outcome is for him. The more the high up muckety mucks try to make it out like he is some kind of a demon possessed individual, the more the common people love him. That's what we see with Jesus. The more the religious people press in and just drive home the fact that they hate Jesus, the more the common people love him. Because you know even the skeptical believers like having Jesus around, especially during his day. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? 
Anytime Jesus is around, there's miracles going on. Anytime Jesus is around, nobody's hungry. Nobody's thirsty. When Jesus is around, there is provision. When Jesus is around, there is joy. When Jesus is around, there is this sense and presence of love and the sense of the Father. I mean, isn't that awesome to have Jesus around? And the more the religious hate Him, the more the common people press into Him. Thank God. You see, some believe because Jesus did miracles. As we enter this season, people will begin to reminisce about Jesus' miracles, His miraculous birth. But don't miss. Don't miss this one point today. Know your stands. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to settle in heaven what Jesus performed on earth. Amen. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Know where you stand, not only this Christmas season, but where you stand on who, what, and who Jesus is to you. Amen. Where you stand this morning. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your for your presence. Lord, I pray today that you would allow this word to be to be rain on. Let it come alive. Lord, help us to, to renew in our hearts today what we believe about you. Lord, help us to, to be ready to give an answer to those that ask about the joy that is in us. Lord, make us effective for your kingdom. Lord, fill us with your joy. Fill us, fill us with your love. Lord, don't let us leave the way we came. In Jesus' name.